Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the number one sports podcast on the entire planet. I'm your host, Drake Tharp, and we are at episode 31. We are into the first round, the midst of the first round of the NBA playoffs. We're just around the corner for NFL draft time, and we got a lot of news on the table. Let's jump right into the show. So, um, the Celtics have swept the Nets. I had the Celtics in seven games, and, you know, a lot of, you know, betting odds had the Nets, uh, to win the East in total before the season, throughout the season, even heading into the playoffs as an eight seed. The the uh, Vegas had, you know, Brooklyn as one of the top teams to take the East. Understandable. They had Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, James Harden, and now Ben Simmons throughout the entire year. But someone was after the torch, the, the long, lengthy scorer torch, the torch of the, you know, second best player in the league, essentially, uh, LeBron, you know, Kevin Durant has been behind LeBron James throughout his entire career and could never get up to snuff of the king. You know, he's always been one step behind. He hasn't been able to lead a team to the finals. And let's be real here. The Warriors team that was led by Kevin Durant, in quotations, has has been led by Steph Curry. That is the heart and soul of Golden State. Let's not get it twisted here. Kevin Durant has not won anything leading a team. So, With that being said, after being swept by the Jason Tatum-led Celtics, has Kevin Durant passed the torch to Jason Tatum? Here, I will tell you why this has potentially happened. Um, If, you know, in the the near future, if Kevin Durant sees Jason Tatum in the playoffs again next year, the year after that, it could get ugly. Here's, Here's a few cases as to why Jason Tatum may have taken the torch already. Durant can't lead a team. We've seen it with... OKC, okay, he's been to the finals. He hasn't won one. He's now on Brooklyn playing with his friends. That seems to be more important than winning. A Golden State, that was just to get a ring. Let's be real here. It's been led by Steph Curry the entire time. Durant cannot lead a team to a championship. We know stars like Steph Curry can, Kawhi Leonard, LeBron James. But Kevin Durant has been known to be, you know, best player, second best player in the league from time to time. But he can't get a team victory. A team victory is what matters. Rings is what matters in the NBA. It's a lot different discussion, but rings is essentially what matters uh, when you're talking about greatness and, you know, in most people's minds. Um, Tatum is more team oriented. Uh, Tatum, you know, wants team success. Durant, uh, you know, he's jumped ship numerous times. He hasn't built from the ground up. Um, you know, I'd say Jason Tatum makes the smarter play nine times out of ten than Kevin Durant does. You know, the smartest play on the court might be for Kevin Durant to shoot every time. But Jason Tatum, they play very team-oriented ball, very Phoenix Suns-esque ball just in the East and with very good defense. Um, another thing, Tatum is an elite distributor. Tatum distributes the ball. I think during the Easter game at halftime, Tatum was already at 10 assists. Um, during, I think that was the first game of the Nets Celtics series that they took and they ran with it and they swept them. Uh, they, the offense looks so easy for the Celtics and Jason Tatum because they have defense to back it up. The Nets never took pride in their defense. Kevin Durant, you know, has always been, I'd say more of an underrated defender, but they don't take pride in their defense like the Celtics do. Um, you know, I think the team builds up Tatum to be very much better than what he is as an ISO player and as just a regular player. So, and they have, you know, the comparison here. They have the same skill set. Long, lengthy, close to seven-foot guys that can shoot, can make shifty moves to the basket. Uh, they essentially have the same skill set. Tatum, just younger. Um, it seems to be more potential right now. They're a lot more team-oriented. I like the, you know, Kevin Durant passing the torch to Jason Tatum. I think we've seen it, and I think it's off and running here in the future. Jason Tatum is becoming a megastar here in the NBA, and I think it's safe to say he's already become one. Taking down Durant in the first round of the NBA playoffs, mark it down, Jason Tatum, next megastar in the league. We'll see if he can get an MVP behind his belt. We'll see if he can become the, I don't know, Giannis is in the league. So it's hard, It's tough to as long as Giannis is in the league, there's really, for the next, let's say, five, ten years, there's no better player than Giannis in the next five to ten years. So, but can Tatum be that guy to lead the Celtics to the finals? We'll see. Uh, speaking of the first round, a very neck and neck series that we thought was going to be a sweepage, uh, you know, due to Devin Booker's injury. It's not. Pelican Suns tied at two to two. 
And I can only make one explanation for this. Yes, Devin Booker's out, but, you know, a one seed like the Suns, a very team-oriented uh, basketball club, you know, led by Chris Paul, the, big, the best floor general in probably the 2000s era, the Suns aren't used to not being a completely healthy team. Uh, you know, last year, they, they ran through the playoffs, you know, the entire time. They just blew through the West, and the explanation was they stayed completely healthy. Chris Paul, Devin Booker, DeAndre Ayton, their kind of seri- their kind of uh, version of the big three was healthy the entire time. I'm still high on them. I think they're a team that can adapt. I think Chris Paul, uh, as the floor general, can adapt to any certain situation, and I think they'll take the series 4-2. to two. Um, The only thing stopping that is Brandon Ingram. He is the X factor for the Pelicans. If this guy can go off and drop 40 points and be that megastar that the Pelicans need— Without Zion Williamson, with C.J. McCollum taking, you know, a second hand to Brandon Ingram, Brandon Ingram needs to, you know, drop 40 a game if they're going to compete. But the Suns are an adapting team. I don't see the Pelicans getting past the Suns um, as an upset. I got the Suns winning the series in six. I think they'll take the next two games. And, uh, yeah, for the NBA playoffs, that'll cover it for today. Jumping into the NFL draft, which is next Thursday, um, you know, there's a lot of first round prospects. There's a lot of, you know, talk about, you know, all the mock drafts. If you haven't checked out my mock draft special, go check it out after you watch this video, of course. Um, but there's prospects that we see and we're very high on. We don't get enough talk about the later round prospects. Here's some top sleeper prospects in the NFL draft. I got four of them here and these guys are going to be very productive for their teams. We won't see them go in the first round most likely, but here we go. Number one, I got Brees Hall. Brees Hall, yeah, not Bryce Hall, Brees Hall. He is a uh, Iowa State running back. They produce powerhouse, hard-running running backs like David Montgomery. The, this guy, if any team needs a running back, this is the guy. He's an absolute workhorse. Iowa State produces fiend running backs. He's very high on um, a lot of analyst lists for running backs, but, you know, we haven't seen... Uh, a lot of running back coverage in the first round. We'll see here. Brees Hall, potential first round talent. He's going to go later in the probably later second round or early third round is, you know, is what I'm guessing. Uh, keep an eye on Brees Hall. He's an absolute horse of running back. Reminds me a lot of David Montgomery. Stay tuned with him. Number two, Wandale Robinson, uh, Kentucky wide receiver, kind of hybrid running back wide receiver type deal. He is a elite speedster with great agility. Uh, great acceleration. A guy like the uh, a guy that the Chiefs could use to bring him bring him in as a replacement for Tyreek Hill in the later rounds. He's not going to go early. This guy is five seven, you know, barely breaching over one eighty five pounds. He is an absolute speedster. He this guy's great acceleration, great agility. Uh, he played for Nebraska. I was lucky to watch him uh in his early days uh, in person and you could tell this guy has it he's he's just a track star he's got the speed he's a big play threat all around the field he's gonna go in the later rounds whichever, whichever team gets him he could be lucky i think the chiefs should keep an eye on him as a replacement for tyree kill but this guy's gonna be a deep ball threat and he's gonna be special in the league uh, number three, Cam Taylor Britt, cornerback for Nebraska. This guy is a late round sleeper. He's got very good speed for a cornerback, and he's a very good press coverage guy. Um, he's not going to go in the first two rounds. Uh, he's a good corner. Uh, we see a lot of good cornerback talent with Sauce Gardner, Derek Stingley, Trent McDuffie, guys like that. Cam Taylor Britt, if this was you know kind of a weaker corner class, this guy would be top three in the cornerback pros- uh, prospects. He's a late round sleeper. Don't get it twisted. Cam Taylor Britt, I see him maybe late third round, fourth round. So if your team gets him, you have an all pro waiting. Number four, Justin Ross. As a freshman, Justin Ross's ceiling was sky high. After posting 1,000 yards in his first year, Justin Ross be kind of became a locker room diva. Um, he, you know, it's something that needs to be taken care of. But after locker room issues, Justin Ross has no guidance but loads of talent. As we see, Clemson has been the self proclaimed wide receiver you. You have guys like DeAndre Hopkins coming out of Clemson, um, you know, Hunter Renfro, guys like that. They're they're very good wide receiver, wide receiver college. Um, maybe Alabama has wide receiver U. I don't know. Debate it in the comments. But as a freshman, Justin Ross's ceiling looks sky high. Um, the talent's there. He just needs some guidance. Justin Ross not projected to go in the first or second round. Um, after that, it's mostly day three for Justin Ross. But he's got all the skill in the world. 
Um, if you're a team that's willing to take on the risk of a diva, but elite talent, this is your guy right here, Justin Ross, all the talent in the world. Um, for our main event of the show, Debo Samuel, if you haven't seen, has demanded a trade from the 49ers, apparently not happy with how he's being used. Um, I got my top destinations for Debo Samuel, top four destinations, and if the 49ers go ahead and trade him, they said they're not going to trade him, but these are four teams that could definitely use him. Um, number one, I got the Lions. They uh, they need a wide receiver one. DJ Chark and Amon Ross St. Brown are promising, but not enough for an elite receiving core. With that kind of speed, uh, DJ Chark is more of an, a physical receiver. Put Debo Samuel in the slot or on the other side, and they have a speed threat, a physical threat, and Amon Ross St. Brown, kind of a hybrid receiver, young. We haven't seen a lot of him, but uh, he looks very promising. So that could boost up the Lions into the elite receiving core category if they pick up uh, Debo Samuel. Number two, I got the Titans with AJ Brown potentially being traded. The Titan used, the Titans could very well use a speed threat um, for for the life of them. <laughs> the power combo with Derrick Henry and having a speed threat like Debo Samuel could wreak absolute havoc in the playoffs. You know, it was mostly all Derrick Henry when they made their uh, 2019 playoff run to the AFC title game against the Chiefs. Um, they mostly just ran the ball the entire time. Power run. It was, that was it the entire time. You give them a speed threat, you give them a deep ball threat, uh, they could turn into, you know, a running gun type offense. Um, they can, you know, gain five yards per play with Derrick Henry, open up the pass game for Debo Samuel. It could look nasty if the Titans could pick him up. Uh, number three, I got the Jets. Zach Wilson, you know, he could definitely use an elite talent like Debo to spark the offense, give him an edge uh as a rookie quarterback he needs an elite target elijah moore is not going to cut it right now new york is a great attraction for an upcoming star like debo uh debo has been seen clubbing a lot uh there's a lot of good clubs in new york i've heard uh you know and they also have lots of draft capital so if the jets want to go at debo samuel they could bring hella picks and you know potentially bring debo to the squad new york's a great attraction zach wilson could use a, a beast target like debo and give the Jets, you know, an offensive spark that they definitely need for their rebuild. And last but not least, we have the Bears. Yes, uh, it's not bias or anything. Just be quiet, okay? But listen, Darnell Mooney, if you're not aware, he's not a legit wide receiver one currently. Darnell Mooney is a speedster. Um, he's a very dangerous deep ball threat. I like him a lot. A double speed threat for the Bears, however, with Debo Samuel could be deadly especially with the new staff. The new staff needs something to spark that offense. Justin Fields is looking very promising. Darnell Mooney is looking promising. Do you get another, another speed threat receiver on the other side with Darnell Mooney like Debo? It could look very dangerous and, you know, give their run game something to build off with the pass game. Uh, however, the Bears have no draft capital, so if they want to go after a trade, I don't know how they're going to do it, but this would be deadly for Chicago and kind of boost uh, the Bears in the same way as I said the Jets. Give the rookie quarterback something to build with. Give him his options. They need it bad. You can't see just a talent like Justin Fields go very you know soon. So to keep Justin Fields happy with the Bears, give him his targets. Well, I think that about covers it for today. It's kind of a shorter episode. I've been trying to keep it around the 15-minute mark, but, uh, you know, try to keep it short for you guys i know you guys got a long day ahead of you um once again if you haven't checked out my nfl mock draft special go check it out uh it's about 45 minutes long we did a full first round coverage video no trades but um you know most likely what teams are most likely going to take uh kind of went at that it was a fun time if you haven't checked that out go check it out uh this has been episode 31 thanks for coming along and watching and listening however you're listening spotify youtube Thanks for listening, and I will see you guys next episode or next video. I'm kind of a go-with-the-flow type guy, so I'll see you guys next time. Peace.